Good morning. Shalom. Okay, so he's standing here, okay. I'm a little bit taller than your pastor, so um, <laughs> he'll have to uh, adjust the mic. It's really good to see you all, both in person and those who are seeing us on, on the Zoom. Hello, good morning. Shalom to you this morning. And uh, could I start with just uh, making a noise with this? Do you know what this is? Okay, so show far, show good. Let's see what happens. I'm going to take you on some shofari this morning as we listen to the sound of the trumpet to start with. And the, the shofar is very, very interesting. It's, it's an instrument that comes from an animal's horn. And as we know, the animal's horn is a symbol of its strength, its ability to fight. And we, we told one of the images that God gives us is he's, he's the horn of our salvation. He's the horn of our strength. He's the one who comes to our aid. So when we call to him, he responds to our, our call and our, our cry. So let's blow the shofar and let's ask the Lord to come to our aid and uh, be at our side and hold our hand and walk with us each and every day. Okay, so here it goes. Did, did you hear that? Uh, oh, good. Okay, good. Great. So the Shafar is also a call to worship. It was used to announce the coronation of the king. And as we know, in the Hebrew calendar, in fact, I've got our latest one here. This is our latest biblical calendar. The, the Hebrew calendar uh, in the seventh month, which has just been the seventh month, it is actually announced with the sound of the Shafar, the sound of trumpets, heralds it. And that's quite appropriate because it's the time which heralds the great king. The king of the universe, the master of the universe is heralded with the sound of trumpets. So it's a time where we look at crowning the Lord as king and bowing down before him and realizing who is the Lord of all the earth? Who is the Lord of the heavens? Who made our spirit? That was a question. Okay, none of you know. It's fine. Don't worry. Okay. Right, and you who are watching the stream, do you have the answer there? Well, of course, the one who gave us life, that created the maker, the one who is the word of life himself, who came to this earth as a human being, emptying himself of all his glory. For what purpose? So that he could come and save us. Quite simple. Because of the Father's great love. The Father's great love for us. So this morning I've got a message entitled, God has a gift and God has a a plan and i think if i just do this you'll see the next slide yes okay super all right so you can all see that and why have i got such a title where did i get such a title from well i actually didn't come up with that title but if you look at that that title you'll see that that is actually the message of the gospel that's the message of of the scripture if you think about it and when we think of a gift a gift is something you don't earn, do you? No, you don't pay for the gift, else it's not a gift, because then you've given your wages. A gift is something that is on offer, that's freely received, but who pays the price for securing the gift? Someone else pays the price, so the gift isn't free for the giver. They have invested into that gift and they give it to you freely, but it's cost them. And then the other part, God has a plan. You know that God is never caught up short. God always has a plan. And there's only one plan that God's ever been working on. <laughs> it's the gospel plan. And that gospel plan is his great love for us. That gospel plan is his rescue of us. And so this morning, I come to you as a Jewish man who God has a gift and a plan for. And I want to share you a little bit of my story. I hope to encourage you with that. And I'm going to share you, share you, share with you a few bits and pieces to just show you how God uses such a diverse variety of pieces to make the plan work, the big and the small. And that's very, very important that God uses all things. 
for God formed everything. So he will use everything for his purposes and his glory because it's his gift and it's his plan. Can I just say a word of prayer? Father, I just thank you that you do have a gift and you do have a plan and that gift and plan involves each one of us. Thank you, Lord, that you love all of your creation and you want all to come to know you. Lord, we thank you and praise you this morning. Open our hearts that we can receive your word from your spirit. Amen. So I, I'm, I'm a Jewish man who was born again in 1994. And this is all because of God's grace. All of his gift, all of his, his, his plan. If you don't know my name, my name is Michael. And uh, you can come tell me later what that means. Okay, what the name means. The name's, my name's very significant in terms of, of, of meaning. And each of you has a name, and each of your names is significant. And each of your names has meaning. Just as each of you has a certain amount of hairs on your head, I'm getting less and less. And God knows how many there are on your head. He knows every single hair on your head. Do you, are you aware of that? Are you aware of how many hairs are on your head? Okay, you haven't started counting them. Okay, that's good. That's, that's good. It's easier for me. I don't have to count so, so, so many anymore. But uh, let's go to this message title, God is a gift and God is a plan. I actually picked this up when I was a child and I was in primary school. And in primary school, I went to government school. I went to Yoga Boys Primary School. And it was every week we would have a music lesson. I'm sure you had those too. And the teacher would try to create some sort of order with this gaggle of boys. Can you call it that? A herd of boys. And uh, we would each take a different instrument, the triangle, the xylophone, the cymbals, the drum, and so on. And she would play on the piano and she would try to get us to make some form of joyful noise. I think there was a lot of noise. Definitely a lot, lot of noise. And just to give you the, uh, the constitution of the demographic of boys at that point in time, we had a whole collection of the Mediterranean. So we had Jews, Italians, Portuguese, Greeks, and then we, we also had uh, thrown in for some, some good measure. We also had some Brits. So can you imagine it was quite a, a lively bunch. And Mediterraneans are known for their uh, quietness and passivity. Okay, so I think that uh, sometimes maybe the principal should have had like a riot shield and tear gas to control the boys. Anyway, let's get to the focus of why I'm telling you this part of my story. That as a child in primary school, my music teacher had a great influence on my life. This is important because we need to understand that God calls, calls all of us to influence others. In fact, I want you to pray for me. This afternoon, I'm going to go see two unsaved Jewish people. And you might remember, I'm sure you remember your previous speaker uh, that you had from our ministry. And he might have told you about a project that he was working on. Right? Anyway, two of the people in that book, I'm going to go see this afternoon. And I need your prayers. Because I go as a vessel... But it's only God who can bring salvation. Only God who can give the gift and the plan and, and bring that into fulfillment. And I have to trust that I'm part of that process. Just as my music teacher was part of God's process in my life when I was a child. And, and she said two significant things to us children. She said, God is a gift for each of you children. Now, can you imagine? Well, I don't have to imagine. I was thinking... Wow, what's the gift? What's the gift? You see, I always believed in God. I just didn't know him. I never doubted his existence. But I didn't know who he is. I don't know what he was like. I thought that, that he was um, somewhere in the sky with a big stick ready to give me a clout when I got out of hand. Maybe that was your picture of God. Maybe that still is your picture of God. I don't know. Only God can see the heart. I, I can't see your heart. But I'm sharing with you what I, I went through, and I'm hoping there's some connection and that, that encourages you. So I, I wondered, what is God's gift? But then she also would say something very intriguing as well, which really got my attention. She said, God has a special plan for the Jews. 
Do you know what that plan is? Well, guess what? I wondered what that plan was because me being a Jewish kid, I wanted, wow, what's the plan? <laughs> what's the special plan? Plan for the Jews. Okay. She never said plan for the Gentiles or plan for the Christians. She said God has a plan for the Jews. Wow. And do you know that God's plan for the Jews is part of his plan for the world? When God spoke to Abraham in Genesis 12, he told Abraham, uh, his name wasn't even Abraham then, his name was Avram. And God said, gave him an incredible promise if he would obey him, that he had to leave everything he knew and go to a place that he didn't know. And that through that obedience, a blessing would come to all the nations. And so even with his name, his name would change. It would become Avraham which means father of many nations. But that would come through his obedience, his walking with God, him listening to him, doing what God told him. Now, I want you to understand that Abraham wasn't perfect. He didn't get everything right, but he listened to God. Yeah. It wasn't about getting every tiny little bit right. Okay. But it was about being obedient, obedient to the Lord. And the Lord used that so that each one of us should be able to say, you know what, because of Abraham's obedience, I've been included in the blessing. The blessing that came to us Jewish people and the blessing that came to the nations. So that we can all be blessed. And as the mystery unfolds, that we get incorporated into God's incredible plan and God's incredible blessing of what the book of Ephesians calls the one new man. Do you know that God speaks about one new man, a new creation? And when Jesus sat with his disciples as he was getting ready to go suffer terribly for us and be the offering that takes away the sin of the world, he spoke about a new covenant that he would initiate this new covenant, which was part of God's plan to bring a blessing to all the nations. And it would start where? In Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. Speaking of Jerusalem, uh, okay, I was going to show you something, but I'm just going to tell you about it. Uh, I've started a little project, a personal project, and I, wanna, I want you to be able to join in the journey. And I've got a draft of that project with me at the back at, at the book table. You're welcome to come have a look at it. And it's a, it's a photographic journey through, through parts of Jerusalem, which I think are very, very significant. And uh, remember, Jesus came to that city and he wept over the city. He wept over that city as he knew that he wasn't going to be received by the leadership of our people. But who did receive him? The children. Are you a children? You need to be a children to recognize the Messiah and to see the kingdom and to come into the kingdom. You have to get rid of all your preconceived ideas and all your knowledge and all your wisdom. And you have to say, Lord, I've got nothing to offer you. I come in my poverty. You've got everything. I've got nothing. Please let me have your gift. So we have to come in humility. We have to come like a child. The children welcome Jesus into Jerusalem. They sang his praises. Remember that. Amazing, eh? Amazing. It doesn't matter how old we are. God has a gift and God has a plan, but we've got to come as a child. So maybe that's why God was speaking to me as a child, because he could sow seed. He could sow seed and I would receive that seed before I became too clever and uh, didn't have any place for him in my life. So God started sowing that seed very early on. So I began to wonder about this gift and I wondered about this plan. What was it? So here we see a picture. This is from our travels in Israel. A picture from a sculpture. And the sculpture was a part of a temporary exhibit. Has anyone been to Israel? Let's see by a show of hands. And you can also show your feet if your hands aren't working. All right. All right. Perfect. 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 So outside the old city of Jerusalem and... Uh, Quite a bit of the old city, especially the walls, are actually a national monument now. The walls of Jerusalem are, are part of a national 
a national heritage monument. And outside of the city walls, as you travel a bit more north, you've got some more modern buildings and there's an open air mall. And in this open air mall, they use part of it to actually exhibit various works of art. And they, they rotate these works of art. So if you're there and there's something you like, best get a picture of it because it won't be there the next time. And on this trip, I saw this sculpture and it really intrigued me. So I'm going to pause for a moment. I want you to have a look. I want you to focus what's on the screen. Now's a good time to have a look at what's on the screen. Okay, not on the television screen, or maybe you're watching on the TV screen, but on the, on the, on the screen right now that's transmitting. What do you see there? Because your destiny is tied to what you see there, whether you are aware of it or not. This morning you came and you said, I'm going to come. I'm going to come and celebrate the Lord. I want to give you a picture of God's gift. I want to give you a visual of his plan. All right. And God is a big picture person. Can I use the word person? Okay, because we understand that he is a person. He has personality. He's given us his image. We are persons. We have personality. Okay. So have a look there. And then don't be scared. Shout out what you see. I want to know what is the personality you see there. What part of scripture is in full view there. Very interesting depiction. Perfect. So Jacob, remember, he's running away from his brother, his twin brother Esau, and he has stolen his birthright and his blessing, and his brother wants to kill him. And that wasn't a figure of speech. Literally, he wanted to kill this man. Jacob's running away. On the way, he has a dream, and he meets with God in the dream, and God gives him a promise incredible promise of his purpose and his destiny gives him his plan and there's a gift in that plan and he sees angels ascending to heaven and descending from heaven up and down this ladder or the staircase and uh, so why am i showing you this well obviously i want to tie it into god's promise because through this man and remember he's the grandson of abraham Abraham was promised that through him a blessing would flow. But this blessing was going to come through his DNA. Do you notice that the staircase looks like a DNA spiral? All right. So God was going to partner with man. Now, this is very, very important in terms of the gift. Is that God has always partnered with man. And part of the gift and part of the plan is a heaven-earth partnership. Heaven and earth in partnership to achieve God's purposes. God wants us to walk with him. This is very important. God wants to walk with each one of us to fulfill his plan. And uh, so God always looks for a vessel who will listen to him and obey him. So it's going to take a while for, for, for God to get Jacob's attention, but it would eventually work out and he would come to a point where he would end up wrestling with, with a mysterious man. Do you remember that? On his own. And in that wrestling, he received a blessing. And he also received a problem with his hip. Do you remember that? Okay, how's your hips? Are you hip this morning? God changed his name to Israel. And embedded in Israel is the promise of the new covenant, is the promise of the Messiah. And so Jesus would come as that spotless lamb. He would be the perfect man. And his partnership with heaven through the Holy Spirit would usher in what God wanted for all of us, to rescue us, restore us, and open the way so that we can go home to our heavenly Father. And receive our original purpose. And as just as this man was a picture of one who took the birthright, took the blessing. So for each one of us, God wants us to be his firstborn children. 
and he wants to give us a birthright and he wants to give us a blessing. You need to carry that with you. It doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't matter what anyone said about you. God is a gift and God is a plan. Always. No one here is an accident. It doesn't matter whether you are two or 92. Apologies if there's anyone over 92 or below two. But God doesn't make any mistakes. And his life and your life, there's no mistake there. And he wants to interweave his life with your life in your journey. It's as simple as that. So I also bring up the person of Jacob because my own earthly father, his name is Jacob. And I was privileged when my dad was 94, 95. We weren't too sure exactly how old he was. Um, I was able to put him into the hands of the Lord and then he died a few hours after that. That is my privilege that I was able to lead another Jacob into his birthright and his blessing, God's gift and God's plan. And I want to just tell you something about my dad and myself and my own journey is as we go through life, God opens things up. He brings revelation. He changes your worldview. He opens your eyes so you can start to see. And part of my growth was being able to see and to question that he gave me eyes to see and to question and to realize that reality is more than just what we see or believe or understand at a time. We can have that re reality modified. And God needs to modify our reality. He really does. Else we stay blind. Really, we stay blind. So my dad's name is Jacob. And I need to tell you that my, my dad was actually about 17 years older than my mom. And uh, so... I was, well, he was, I just need to get this right. He was about 55 years old when I was born. I was the third of four children. And uh, so when he dropped me off at school, guess what the other boys asked? They asked me about my granddad. That's right. I said, no, that's not my granddad. In fact, I never knew any of my grandfathers. I didn't. I didn't know them. They'd, they'd passed away before I was born even. And uh, so I said, no, that's, that's my dad. So then I realized that the other boys' dads were much younger. So there's a shift here in my reality. In my little world, it's getting shifted. It's getting challenged. It's moving. And they asked me, well, go find out how old your dad is. So I went to my dad. You know, we're chatting about what happened at school today. Oh, and dad, you know, the, the other boys, they want to know how old you are. So my dad, with a straight face, said to me, I'm 100. <laughs> so guess what? I believed him. And I've got no frame of reference to see that. So I, I take that message back to the boys the next day, and they all laughed at me. <laughs> okay. So I realized my dad isn't 100 yet. <laughs> He's certainly not 100. And uh, God was just opening up my world. Now, being a Jewish kid, one of the very important junctures of my life was my coming of age ceremony. Now, there's a couple of life cycle events that have been put in place in a Jewish kid's life. One is at age 13, as a boy, you have a bar mitzvah. Do you know what bar mitzvah means? Literally, it's, it's, it's from Aramaic. Bar meaning son, mitzvah, commandment. Son of the commandment. And so you study for a couple of years so that you can get up in the synagogue and you'll read a portion of scripture. In fact, you'll sing it. Do you know that God's word gets sung? And do you know that all of God's word can be sung? There's a tune for every verse. Are you aware of that? You think it's only the songs. No, it's not. The Lord sings songs of deliverance over us. That's what it says in Zephaniah. Have you ever thought of God singing over you? I mean, you sing to God. Have you ever thought of him singing back? Think about that. Anyway, in synagogue, you sing, and you sing the portion that's 
allotted to you. And just coming back to the calendar, if you want to get a calendar, it's got all the portions here that are sung throughout the year. And they're actually quite prophetic because God's word is prophetic. As we read Moses, we should meet the Messiah. That's the plan. He's hidden there in all the types, images, and, and stories, offerings, and sacrifices. It's all about Jesus. God's gift and God's plan. So let me, let me get back to my bar mitzvah story, which is another piece of the puzzle. So for that, I need to get the scripture out. Okay, so what I have here, I've got a tablet. Now, speaking to Moses, how many tablets did he get? He actually got four because he broke the first two. Manufacturing defect. Happens when you drop stuff. But I mean, who can blame the guy? You know, you send an octogenarian up a mountain. Oh, no, you go, you go. We'll, we'll, we'll stay down here and be good. You go, you go. Anyway, uh, God has to give him another set after the rebellion with the golden calf. Let's go to scripture. And I'm going to one of the parts that Moses wrote down. And I'm taking us to, let's go to the book of Numbers. Because God used this little scripture to speak to me, to start to open my heart. And so in Numbers 15, and we go to verse 37, I'm just going to read two verses. The Lord said to Moses, that's verse 37. Now, what did he say? Over here in verse 38, he said, Speak to the people of Israel let, and tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a cord of blue on the tassel of each corner. Okay. That's the scripture there. Numbers 15, 37, 38. Simple, hey? Now, why is that so significant? Have any of you wearing tassels this morning? I think the closest we got to tassels is shoelaces. And what do we have to keep doing with them? Keep tying them. <laughs> so God gave us a memory aid. And the memory aid was there to actually remind us of his word. We needed a constant reminder of his word so that we could come back to his word so that we would stay on the path of his plan. Because the moment we deviated from his word, what happened to the plan? It wasn't God's plan anymore. It became our plan. All right. And Jesus speaks of two plans, a narrow path and a broad path. When we're on our plan, we're on a broad path. When we're on his plan, we're on a narrow path. Quite simple. One leads where? And the other? Correct. So God knows that we, we need constant recalibrating. So he gave us a, a very simple way that we could do this, that on the corner of our garments, we had put these little tassels, these fringes, and when we looked at them, they would remind us of his word. Very, very simple. And so in the course of, of your daily activities, you looked at this, you sought reminder of his word in the morning, in the noon, and at night, and whenever other you actually looked at. It was a very interesting, simple memory aid. And part of the instruction was to put a cord of blue. Now, this was a word that really spoke to my heart because part of my bar mitzvah training was to learn about our culture and our traditions. And one of our traditions was the prayer shawl and donning the prayer shawl and reciting the blessing before you put on the prayer shawl when you went into the synagogue. And we would go to synagogue every Sabbath. Every Saturday morning, we would be in the synagogue with our Hebrew school teacher who would keep a very watchful eye over us boys. But now this is where this really started to speak to me. How? Well, when I examined the prayer shawl and I looked at the, the tassels, do you think I could find a cord of blue? No. There was just white tassels, no, no blue on any of the corners of that, of that garment. And so I began to wonder, why don't we have the blue? I mean, God's commanded us, put in the blue. We don't have the blue. And at one point I thought, well, maybe, the, maybe the, the other boys have pulled the blue out because I didn't have my own prayer shawl, so I'd take one from a communal box every time we went into synagogue. I'd put a different one on. I'd look for the blue. There's no blue. What does the color blue remind you of? Okay, you need to get out a bit more. What does the color blue remind you of? Let's make it simple. What's blue? The sky. Yes, not difficult. Eh? <laughs> and when you look at the sky, what do you think of? 
heaven, yes, the color of heaven, the color of God's kingdom, the Holy Spirit, and, and so on. All right. So God wanted us to remember him, his word, okay, and so on. And if we think about it, if we go back to the Garden of Eden, what led, Eve said I was deceived, and she was totally right, but what led to her being deceived? What commandment had God given? Because in the day that you do, what will happen? Do not, in the day that you eat, what will be the consequence if you do? Surely die. Not you will die, you will surely die. There's a double in the, in the Hebrew there. Okay, so it's not like, oh, you'll die, maybe you'll die, possibly you'll die. Read the T's and C's. No, surely die. You will surely die. The serpent said, you will not surely die. That's called, what's that called? It's called a lie. <laughs> All right. So can you see our track record's not really good? So God wanted us to give us a means to remember. So we go look, look at this and then go to his word, not man's word. This is very, very important. It could not be the word of man. It had to be the word of God to put us back on track, back on track. So now we didn't have this blue, um, this blue, blue thread and I really wondered about why don't we have the blue thread because the boys couldn't all be so naughty that they pulled out all the blue threads out of all the prayer shawls. Have you ever done any naughty things as a kid? Okay, no need to confess now. I don't have enough time. All right. But I just want you to think. So I came to the conclusion, no. This is my conclusion. No one had pulled out the blue thread. We were not putting in the blue thread. And my question was, why? Why? So let's step back from this. I just want to just draw a few threads, mind the pun, together here. Can you see how God was working? Through the witness of a music teacher, and I haven't told you that she was born again. I also haven't told you that she was praying for each of us children to get saved. So the witness that she sowed, her prayer for us. Okay. Two, can you see the word of God? I had a piece of the word of God in my bar mitzvah training. Not a lot. There was a piece. But God used that to get me to think. Look, think, observe what's going on here. And seeking answers. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He takes different elements. And together he weaves his gift and his plan into our life. Because it is a journey of discovery. And it eventually leads to us discovering him. But he finds us. He has us seeking him. That's the point. We sow seeds whether we are aware of it or not. People are watching us. What we say. What we do. We are sowing seeds whether we are aware of it or not. And people take those seeds. And there's going to be a good harvest or a bitter harvest. We need to, know, we need to be aware of the seed we sow. Quite simple. So now I'm showing you the slide, and the slide reveals where we got the blue dye from. A tiny little creature. Do you see? There's the name. I'm not going to even try to pronounce it for you, but can you all see that? This little snail, they would get the dye from the snail and use it to make all the different items, including these fringes, which we call tzitzit. Can you say tzitzit? Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Okay, all those who are born again say it's it's it. Ah, okay, that's better. <laughs> all those who are not born again uh, say, okay. So what's it's it? It's it's the Hebrew for these fringes. The singular speaks of a bud. And what do you get from a bud? As spring has sprung, what does a bud become? a flower, a blossom, and the bees come and they take the pollen and they pollinate. And if there's a fruit tree, it's going to become a fruit. Okay. And so on. So there's potential in that bud. Isn't it so interesting that these tassels are called tzitzit? They speak of buds and they remind us of God's word, that God's word's like a seed and it's good seed and it's going to bud and produce a harvest. That's his promise. It will produce a harvest, 30, 60, and 100 fold. And I pray for you that you will also see that harvest of 30, 
60 and 100 fold as his word buds and flourishes in each of your lives and your family's lives because his word is good and he's good for his word and his word is living, it's active and his word achieves the purpose for which he sends it. And that's what happened in my life. I haven't given you all my story, but I've given you fragments. Can you see how God used a little creature that produced blue that, why didn't we have the blue? Because what? guess what? The creature disappeared. Gone. Then the creature resurfaces. I think it was about 20 years ago. Okay, don't quote me on that. But that's why I never had any blue tassels because we never had the little snail. And so we couldn't get the blue dye. So we stopped dying. But can you see how God used that to speak to me, to wonder why not, and that the blue would lead me to heaven, the kingdom of heaven. Now here's a picture. When I went to Israel, uh, I began to see... I found out about the snail. Then I understood why we never had the blue. And uh, do you see here are tassels dyed with blue. Came back. Isn't that interesting? All right. I'm going to draw my long journey. There's lots more to the story. But I just wanted to illustrate some points the diversity of what God will use. He'll use his creation, his creatures in his creation. He'll use his word and he'll use others who are his witnesses, who share that word in creative ways so that we can come to his gift and we can come to his plan. And for those of you who've been to Israel and those who haven't, there's a place north of the old city, where there's an empty tomb. Why is there an empty tomb? Because Jesus is not there. That's why it's empty. <laughs> he's not there. And when his bewildered disciples went to have a look, some of them had angelic visitors who said, he's not here. <laughs> he's risen. Where are you going to go see him? In Joburg. No, where did they say you must, they must go? Go to the Galilee. Go to the Galilee. He has risen. He'll meet you there. He'll meet you in the Galilee. So, to bring what I wanted to share with you this morning about God's gift and God's plan, it would culminate in the death. Well, before Jesus died, his horrible dying, his death, his, we, we say burial in the tomb, but our understanding of burial and their understanding is a little different, okay? Anyway, his burial in the tomb, and then his resurrection. His ascension, he's seated at the place of authority, and he's waiting to return. That's the gift. That's the gift, and that's the plan. And he made it possible. And he left behind an empty tomb. Because he wasn't there. He had the keys. The keys of death. And the keys. What were the keys he had? Yeah, death and Hades. The keys of death. And the keys of the place of death. He had won the victory for us. And that's the gift and that's the plan for each one of us. And in 1994, what happened in 1994? Does anyone remember? What happened in 1994? Were you there? Okay, a lot happened in 1994. No, I'm not looking about that. I got saved in 94. That's what's important, what happened. All right. In 1994, I was elected. Election. The gift of election. God chose me. That's what happened. By his grace, he chose me. And as I was at a sunrise service, which happened to be the Passover weekend, that year in 94, the Son of Man rose in my heart. 
because he met me through his Holy Spirit and changed his heart. That's what he did. That was his gift, his plan at that meeting. Nothing of mine. I was just seeking, seeking, trying to find who this God is. But that's where he drew it to our encounter, our meeting at that sunrise service. So that's where I want to leave it. And what I want to tell you in closing is each of you has that gift and plan in you. If you are born again, his spirit lives in you. And wherever you go, you take his spirit with you. And his promise is that when we believe in him, streams of living water will flow from our very inner being. That's his promise. That's his word. Wherever you go, there's water that can flow from you to others. Hallelujah. Can we close in a word of prayer? And then I'll hand back. Father, thank you for your gift. Thank you for your plan. I pray, Lord, your blessing on each and every one of your children here today. Lord, you are our good shepherd. Lead us by the hand. Guide us in the way we must go. Lead us in your paths. And Lord, may we be able to offer your gift and your plan to those that we meet along the way on this journey. We do this not in our own strength, but through the strength and power and might of your spirit. Thank you, Lord. Open our eyes, open our ears, and open our hearts to the opportunities that you and Gentile might hear of that gift and of that plan from you, Lord Jesus. Bless you, Lord. Amen and amen. I'll be available after the service at the back if you want to chat, if you have any questions, if you want to get a calendar. And uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Shalom.